Thank you. Thank you for the nice intro, Jing. Um, so yeah, hello everyone. Uh, really appreciate this opportunity to share with you my research on liquid gas interfacial transfer. This will be uh, some research we've done over the years. And the goal here is to first fundamentally understand the phenomenon and uh, see how this can impact our efforts towards sustainable development. Um, and more specifically, I'll talk about cooling. And as Kai Chen already mentioned, there are a lot of opportunities in heating and cooling in the building sector. And uh, uh, the IEA, the International Energy Agency, actually predicted that without taking any action on the cooling efficiency, the energy demand for cooling will actually be tripled by 2050. And the associated carbon emissions will be doubled, making this very hard for us to reach carbon neutral. And this already accounts for the decarbonization process in the power generation sector. So the point here is that we need low carbon emission technologies that can address the ever increasing need for cooling or for energy and water in general. And as you've seen from the previous work, there are a lot of different ways to address this type of problem. And I chose to work in this field of interfacial transfer between liquid and gas because it happens to play a critical role in a wide range of energy and water applications. So for example, steam cycles for power generation or uh, building HVAC or electronics cooling, as well as uh, clean water production. And so if we take a closer look at this uh, plot, the y axis or the x axis here is the heat flux in the system. Usually this is a good indicator for the system performance. And if we are looking to increase the system performance or even like push it like even higher than what the current is, uh, we need to understand better the transfer limit for the uh, like liquid gas and the facial transfer. And so that will require some fundamental study. On the other hand, for the y-axis, we have the area here. So if we want to make a broader impact uh, on larger area applications, we need scalable materials, we need robust material, we need novel materials. So in today's talk, I'll mostly focus on the fundamental part of interfacial transfer, but at the end, I'll also briefly mention our material innovation effort. So to give an overview, uh, we'll first talk about some fundamental evaporation physics and see how we can better understand it with the help of micro nano engineering. And then I'll tell, about, tell you about uh, how we can leverage this understanding to create a high flux uh, cooling device for electronic systems. And then I'll show you some material uh, innovation effort to create passive cooling solutions. And this is extremely suitable for like food packaging applications. So with that in mind, um, I would like to jump right into this evaporation physics part of my talk. And I want to make a distinction uh, between two types of evaporation. Um, so the first one is diffusion limited evaporation. The second one is kinetic limited evaporation. And you may think we have understood uh, everything about evaporation already at this point, uh, but I'll try to explain to what extent this is true. So uh, the first type of evaporation, diffusion limited evaporation, occurs when you have, for example, a pool of water in air and close to the water uh, gas interface, you have a higher vapor concentration and far away from it, you have a lower concentration. But your total gas pressure is maintained as constant throughout your uh, vapor phase. So the flow of evaporation is purely driven by this concentration gradient. And this is not the case when you have only vapor in your ambient. In that particular case, you would have a higher pressure built up close to the interface. And this pressure difference between uh, the near interface region and the far away region will create expansion flow. And that will make the flow usually faster. So for both of these two cases, because you will have a net flux across the system. So thermodynamics tells you there'll be a non-equilibrium region near the interface when this flux is generated and it can be only relaxed uh, after enough numbers of collisions between molecules. So with this microscopic point of view, you will have a non-equilibrium layer uh, near the interface, usually known as a condensing layer. And whether it's diffusion limited or kinetic limited evaporation, 
outside the condensing layer or far away from the interface, we know that we can use continuum uh, physics to describe the behavior. So whether it's diffusion convection equations or continuum gas dynamics. However, inside the condensing layer, uh, there's some more like subcontinuum physics, which is governed by this Boltzmann transport equation. So here, because psi is the velocity distribution of the molecules, and this equation is basically saying the evolution of psi is a result from the streaming of the molecules, this term, and the collision between molecules. And there are quite a few theoretical works in literature uh, on this topic, but experimentally, it has been difficult to characterize the interfacial heat and mass transfer during evaporation. And there are two reasons for that. So first of all, the interfacial transfer resistance by nature is small compared to either the thermal loss uh, in the liquid due to thermal conduction or the uh, viscous loss in the liquid supply as we're trying to maintain a steady state and replenish liquid as evaporation occurs. And so this makes it hard to isolate the interfacial transfer resistance in your experiment. And secondly, uh, to characterize this resistance, we almost need a magic thermometer that can measure the interface temperature both accurately and also non-invasively. For example, if you're just sticking a thermocouple into a high flux you know, evaporating surface, then most likely it would disturb the local evaporation behavior while you're measuring the temperature. So uh, these are challenges that we need to solve, and we can do that with this concept uh, that is evaporation from an ultra-thin nanoporous membrane. So here you're looking at a meniscus pinned at the top of the nanopore, and on top of this pore, uh, we deposit a metal layer that can serve as both a joule heater and a temperature uh, resistive temperature detector, or RTD. So with this, you can provide the heat very close to the evaporating surface, as close as like less than 50 nanometers uh, away. And so that there will be not much thermal resistance in the liquid phase as you're transferring heat from the heater to the evaporating surface. And similarly, you can measure the temperature here so that is the temperature is measured locally accurately, but not interfering with the evaporation transfer. So those are the benefits that come with a small pore. Usually the penalty with that is a large viscous loss along the pore as you're doing the liquid transfer. So the way we can circumvent this is to make this pore really short, a couple hundred nanometers. And this structure should check all the boxes, but the question is how do we make such kind of a structure? So with a strong effort in the clean room, I was able to create this uh, ultra thin and porous membrane device. And here you're looking at two gold contact paths connected by a suspended membrane. And inside the suspended area at the very center is our active region, uh, which is nanoporous and coated with gold. And during experiment, you will have evaporation induced from the tens of millions of pores from this area. And with this device, uh, now we also need a custom designed test rig that has uh, liquid feed throughs and electrical connections. And then during the operation, uh, water will work into this nanopores and the goal layer here will provide both dual heating and temperature sensing. So now we have the tools to really characterize the interfacial heat and mass transfer. And the first thing I did was a evaporation in air study. So here's some data. The Y axis here is the interfacial heat flux. And the x-axis here is the membrane temperature or the interface temperature, if you may. And the data points here came from different samples of similar geometries. And immediately you notice that we are reaching some rather high evaporation uh, heat flux in air. To provide you some uh, context, in previous like characterization of air ambient evaporation, the heat flux is usually limited uh, to around one watt per centimeter square. And in our case, it's around 500. So this is a big improvement thanks to the minimization of the thermal resistance in the liquid. And because we're now reaching some rather high interfacial heat flux, the air vapor mixture in our system actually has a non-negotiable bulk vapor velocity. 
So when you're doing applying like a traditional fixed law, you're usually assuming that the bulk uh, air and vapor mixture stay static and the flow is pure diffusional. Uh, but now that you have this bulk velocity, there's so-called self-convection fact, also known as the Stefan flow. And to account for the Stefan flow, you actually need to invoke the maxwell stefan equation, as you see from the deviation, uh, like from the more traditional fixed law. But the maxwell stefan agrees well with our experimental data. So this gives us confidence in the reliability of our experimental platform, and we'll continue to use that to uh, using that to study the more complicated evaporation in vapor problem, as you still see in this slide. So here again, the y-axis is interfacial heat flux, and the x-axis is the temperature difference between the membrane or the interface and the far field vapor. These green crosses represent the air ambient data, and if you compare them to the red triangles, you will see that the kinetic limited evaporation is much more efficient than the diffusion limited evaporation uh, as they're at the same ambient uh, vapor or gas temperature. So at the same delta T, the red triangles will give you much higher QW prime or the interfacial heat flux. And we call this ratio between uh, the QW prime and delta T, the interfacial heat transfer coefficient. And this coefficient uh, will continue going up as we are increasing the vapor ambient temperature. So to understand underlying reason for that, we need to take a closer look at our uh, governing equation, which is Boltzmann transfer equation for the condensing uh, layer. And what we found out was that we can normalize the heat flux to this product, that is the saturation vapor density at the liquid surface, the speed of sound in the vapor, and the entropy vaporization. So after this normalization, we get a dimensionless flux. And based on the non-dimensionalization of BTE, this dimensionless flux can only be a function of the delta P over P naught ratio with sigma as a parameter. P naught here is the saturation vapor pressure with the liquid surface temperature. And delta P is the difference between P naught and the ambient vapor pressure. So indeed, this is a pressure-driven flow. And sigma here, also known as the condensation coefficient literature, represents the condensation probability of an incident molecule on the interface. So this is some molecular level uh, parameter that we use in the model. And magically, after doing this non-dimensionalization, experimental data from different working conditions now collapse onto this one single dashed line. And this dashed line comes from the direct simulation Monte Carlo study or simulation of the Boltzmann transfer equation with sigma as a fitting parameter equals uh, 3.31. And you can also treat it as a measurement of this molecular level parameter. But what I want to highlight here is that for the first time, you, we're observing the single parameter behavior that can make us confidently claim that we're reaching the kinetic limit evaporation, which will promise higher evaporation performance. And we also now understand that the interfacial uh, heat transfer coefficient scales with the vapor ambient temperature for a reason, because it, the normalization factor here, they can be treat as, treated as a, a figure merit for evaporation. And the zone knot, the saturation vapor density increases sharply as we're increasing the vapor ambient temperature. So, Indeed, uh, we're making some rather significant fundamental understanding here. But we did not just want to stop here. Instead, we want to look at the applications. And the applications we looked at first uh, with electronics cooling. And in electronics cooling, there's this dilemma. You almost always get better cooling results with water as the cooling fluid. But for obvious reasons, a lot of electronic systems, they do not like water. And the very reason that water performs so well is due to the large thermal connectivity of the liquid, so as shown in this table, as I'm comparing water to a list of other fluids that are much less polar. And, but if you calculate the evaporation frequency merit that we just identified, water is actually the worst. So either our fundamental understanding has some, uh, something wrong or 
if we can optimize the system for inefficient transfer and minimize the liquid thermal resistance in the system, we should get a device that favors the other fluid rather than water. And let's see whether that's the case. So here I'm presenting this hierarchical membrane evaporator. Uh, the liquid will flow in these green channels and then distribute it along the red channels and red micro channels. And these micro channels will be supporting our membrane evaporator. And the supporting micro channels actually provide the high permeability and effective heat transfer paths towards uh, the membrane as you're taking heat from the bottom. And the hierarchy uh, between the green, the red, and eventually the nanopores in the membrane, they can minimize the pressure drop in the device, just like a tree. And more importantly, now that you can take heat from the bottom for this device, rather than have heating at the membrane level, this can be directly integrated onto a heated electronic device. So let's see some device level heat transfer performance. Uh, the y-axis here is the heat dissipation normalized over the total device area. And the x-axis is the temperature difference between the backside of the device and the vapor ambient. So here I'm presenting the data for R245FA and painting two dielectric liquids that are suitable for like high performance electronic systems. Um, and what I want to highlight here is that these data points represents the record high evaporation heat flux for dielectric liquids in literature. And moreover, we did a bunch of different tests for other fluids, uh, for example, methanol, IPA, and water at different temperatures. And what we found was that Generally, liquids with larger figure merit will give you better heat transfer performance, which is a big win for our fundamental study. And more importantly, now we're enabling this new phase change heat transfer paradigm that favors low substantial liquid, high volatility liquid rather than water. And this marks a big improvement in terms of cooling with like electro, uh, dielectric liquids. And that certainly can enable higher computation power, and that would enable a lot of exciting things in the computer science world. However, I also want to comment on the direct impact of electronics cooling on sustainability. Now that we have more and more of the data standards that contains a lot of the, the computer chips, uh, whether it's CPU, GPU, or like even the TPU um, called by Google, and they will have a lot of heat dissipation. So people are working on this warm water cooling scheme for data center buildings. That is to reutilize the heat dissipated by the data centers at the heating loop of the office and residential buildings. And what a more uh, efficient electronics cooling technology can enable is a high, higher temperature in the cooling loop so that you can do waste heat recovery from a higher temperature source that will promise you more energy savings and higher efficiency. So that is uh, what I want to say about the direct impact of uh, electronics cooling on our sustainable development. And beyond electronics cooling, there are also applications for passive evaporative cooling, such as rooftop cooling, uh, like the application that uh, Kaichen mentioned in his talk and also the packaging and storage of pharmaceutical products or food that are perishable goods. And one common problem for this type of system is that they have to operate at subambient temperatures. And once the system is indeed subambient, then inevitably you will have environmental heating because now your environment is at a higher temperature. And this can be detrimental uh, to your system performance. And to that end, we can learn a lot from camels who live in the desert, but they have a really interesting dress code. Uh, they wear very heavy fur. So if we take a closer look at their skin, uh, they have a scap spec gland just like us to generate evaporation. And interestingly, their fur layer, it's both thermally insulating and also, um, and also uh, porous so vapor can go through. And we can learn a lot from this design. Uh, so due to the limited time, I'll really, really uh, briefly mention this work. So uh, we were using this hydrogel aerogel layer to mimic the camel skin 
that is using the hydrogel layer as the evaporation generator and the aerogel layer as the porous insulation because the aerogel is highly insula uh, insulating and also very porous. So with this bilayer, we can actually generate uh, more than 400% improvement in terms of cooling time compared to a single layer, which is rather promising for food packaging application. So now I would like to kind of summarize what we have covered today. Uh, we have discovered this unified relationship for evaporation kinetics. We have used the understanding we gained in this first study to create the high flux electronic cooling device and show the use of novel materials for passive cooling uh, solutions. And it is my belief that we need to make progress in terms of the both fundamental level uh, understanding and also the device level and material level technological advancement to have a strong shot in terms of like enabling more sustainable development of our human society. And with that, I would like to acknowledge my PhD and postdoc advisors, Professor uh, Evelyn Wen, Professor Jeff Grossman, respectively, and all my lab mates, as well as my funding sources. And happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jomo. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty good summary of your, your uh, works of years. Um, so any questions from the audience? Um, maybe I can ask one. Like, uh, I, yeah, I was interested in a, in a, a high flux um, evaporation, evaporator uh, device. Um, similar, so it's very similar to, so those structure like bi, bi layer, I would call it bi layer micro nano structure um, has been used for, for example, um, collecting water for, from, from uh, solar energy and also like to enhance the insulation or enhance the, the, the temperature limits uh, for uh, for linear frost effect, and uh, so I was wondering, like, uh, um, what is the magic of of this bilayer? Um, what is the trick of it? Like, why this is so good for for multiple applications? Yeah, I, I can certainly comment on that. Uh, so one thing, one distinction I want to make is, uh, like, for example, in in those uh, solar based applications, a lot of times. Uh, the vapor and the liquid are, or sorry, the heat and vapor doesn't go in the same, on the same side of the device. Like, uh, so in their case, like the requirements is actually less, but there's a parallel uh, for like between like the application I'm showing here, which is classic cooling that requires this layer to generate vapor, but also to resist uh, heating from the environment. There's a, there's a parallel to that, which is the, uh, um, like the membrane distillation for uh, water purification. In their case, they also want to maximize the water transfer between the hot side and cold side, but also they want to maintain uh, the temperature difference. So they need a similarly insulating material. So uh, the trick is really the vapor and the heat are conduct are transferred through the materials in a very different way. With a porous material, especially when, for example, air gels, um, a vapor can go through still like uh, without uh, being too much impeded, but uh, heat in this case, uh, because the structures are much less than the uh, main free pass of the phonons. And so you're inducing like the heat transfer mechanism become much different. While for vapor, it's like way below the uh, main free pass of the uh, vapor molecules anyway. So it's like not invoking a mechanism change. So Leveraging that, there are a lot of things you can do um, in terms of like uh, having this duality of the uh, phase, like thermal exchange and the vapor exchange. So uh, th that would be my answer. I see. I see. Thank you. Um, a, a practical follow-up question for for this like uh, um, bilayer high flux cooling device is uh, I I can tell that those nano powers uh, would require the the cooling of uh, fluids to to like a more pure i mean like it doesn't have some some salt or anything content or also be um, clogging the the the, the pores um, so if this is using for like an electronic device cooling because the fluids is content um, pre-packaging that that makes sense but if we want to transfer this wonderful technology to like a more scale up uh, more harsh environments. Um, is there any strategy to 
uh, to, to enhance this uh, application for, for these scenarios? That's a, that's a very good point. Uh, like you said, uh, for this study, like uh, indeed we're designing for electronic systems, like it's more like a closed uh, system. So the total amount of contaminants is pretty much limited. And uh, I agree that if it's an open system that you're compl uh, continuing supplying new fluid to your system, then you're basically also introducing new contaminants. And if so, this indeed can be problematic for nanopore uh, like systems. So I think the opportunity here is really to that we have a very thin membrane here uh, as a design. The robustness, robustness is the, a different question, but with the thin membrane, the opportunity is that once you are establishing some sort of contaminant uh, concentration here, the contaminant can diffuse back into the more like bulk liquid. So if you are ensuring flushing very close to the interface, then uh, you can actually calculate the equilibrium concentration of the contaminant at the interface uh, based on initial conditions. And so that allow you to uh, design towards like system that are more robust towards uh, against a contamination and are fallent in the uh, in the fluid. So uh, that that be my suggestion. Yeah, that 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 sounds yeah that sounds yeah that sounds a, a good way to to solve this problem. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, any questions from the the audience? Um, well, this is a where we have two uh, really experts uh, in the in the in the cooling side and take the chance to to ask the question. Um, all right, yeah. If there's no questions, um, we can um, end today's um, webinar. And uh, I would like to thank um, both the speakers to to join in this early day and uh, especially with the change of time. Um, and thank you all for, for coming for today's uh, webinar and uh, we will see you uh, in, in next week. And anyone has more questions, you can stay uh, to ask questions. Um, if not, uh, feel free to leave and have a wonderful uh, Sunday. Thank you. Yeah. Um,